Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Analyst with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to the staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are Josh Scher and David Minert. Josh began at Talks Equifax Workforce Solutions in July of 2008 as a business development representative for the tax management services team, which specializes in unemployment cost management, tax credits and incentives, and employment tax services. Josh is now responsible for working with small to mid-sized clients in the staffing vertical to align our services or their services to fit their needs. Dave has over 29 years of unemployment compensation tax management experience. Dave has worked in account management and client relations where he was responsible for program performance, education, and ongoing customer service of many Fortune and key clients of Equifax Workforce Solutions. Currently, Dave manages the Equifax Workforce Solutions regional tax managers and sales support teams responsible for new business development and subject matter expertise with specific focus and, and emphasis on unemployment cost management. Equifax Workforce Solutions offers a suite of services to assist their clients in maintaining compliance uh, with various federal and local regulations. In the area of unemployment cost management, Equifax Workforce Solutions provides claims administration and hearings and, and employment tax services. Headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, Equifax began business in 1973 and currently services more than 7,000 clients. So today, um, we're going to talk about um, unemployment management and in an effort to replenish the state unemployment reserves and reduce improper benefit payments, states began shifting the responsibility and increased unemployment costs to employers. Uh, so today, our speakers uh, from Equifax are going to share their knowledge on the unemployment system and claims management process for a holistic cost management approach to cover the current economic update, unemployment fundamentals, unemployment compliance, UI integrity laws, and SIDES program, and unemployment cost management. So by the end of today's session, uh, we will have covered how you can reduce your staffing firm's exposure to rising unemployment, employer unemployment costs. If you have any questions during the presentation today, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar, or you can use the chat feature. Uh, after the presentation, there will be some time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short poll. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Josh and David. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, really appreciate the introduction, and uh, thank you all on the line for uh, taking time out of your day to be with us today. Uh, I think uh, we've got some good information for you about the unemployment program and uh, just kind of want to go over a quick agenda for us today. And hopefully we can get the slides going. There we go. Uh, just a little overview of Equifax. I'll start off. Um, we'll get into the current economic environment today surrounding unemployment, uh, which we'll also touch on the recent UI integrity laws. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, unemployment cost management, uh, a little bit of uh, how the unemployment system works and some good best practices that uh, you probably want to put in place to manage the unemployment uh, claims that you're experiencing. So just a quick overview of Equifax. Um, Equifax actually purchased a company called Tox Corporation back in May of 2007. And Tox, as you can see on the slide here, had all of these HR, payroll, and tax management services. The benefit of our clients because Equifax had purchased us is that we were able now to have the resources and abilities to really enhance our services and create best-in-class processes for our clients. 
Today, however, we're just going to focus on unemployment cost management. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dave Minert, who's going to kind of run us through some of the uh, economic stability today uh, in regards to the unemployment management. So, Dave? Thanks, Josh, and good morning and good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Um, we, uh, we welcome the opportunity to talk a little bit about unemployment cost management today. Um, I think, you know, if, if we take a look at the current economic environment, uh, you can only look back a few years ago. Some of you might remember hearing about it on the TV, reading about it in the paper. There was a recession. It was a pretty big one. Um, started at the beginning of 2008 um, and then took off from there, really. And, and what happened there was the unemployment rate, and the, you know, as everybody knows, hit unprecedented highs. There were just significant volumes of unemployment claims being filed um, you know, and what that really did was, you know, drive up unemployment costs, increased unemployment rates for employers, uh, and as well as emptied out a lot of the state funds. Um, so, you know, the recession drove an increase in the overall unemployment costs uh, to as high as, you know, there were $41 billion in unemployment benefits being paid out. Um, the states were running out of money borrowing from the federal government, so there was a lot of federal subsidization going on. There were also a lot of errors in the system uh, that were happening as, as high as even as in 2013. Uh, the Department of Labor still reports almost 11% of the benefits paid out were improper in an error, which uh, essentially what that means, and we'll talk about this a little later on, is when payments are made in error, some employer's account is being charged in error, and their tax rates are impacted by that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But what it really did was change from the Department of Labor's perspective and the state agency's perspective. It put, a, put an emphasis on what we're calling UI integrity. Um, so obviously, when the federal government starts subsidizing these costs, they start to put a lot of pressure on the states to get their acts together uh, and start making less errors. As a result of that, the states then put pressure on the employment community in those states, um, and they've done that. So at the end of 2013, there were a lot of there was a lot of legislation passed that we refer to as UI integrity legislation. And Josh is going to talk a little bit about that uh, in just a few minutes. Just give you an idea, the, the, we, I talked about those, those errors that were being made. So when unemployment benefits are being paid out erroneously, um, you know, if you look at, there's, there's quite a bit of green on this, on this slide, and that, that's basically those ranging from an 8% error ratio to a 12% error ratio. So you might look at that green and think, well, that's pretty good. But I think, you know, if we exclude weather weather forecasters from, from the next comment, if we were all doing our job at about a 90% clip, we probably might be in trouble. So uh, just give you an idea of kind of where the states are today. Um, and they are making great efforts and initiatives to, uh, to improve on that. Um, so if we go to, and why is that important? Because at, during that recession or shortly thereafter, as I mentioned, a lot of states ran out of money. Um, so their state trust funds, which actually employers pay into to fund the system, they ran out of money and had to borrow from the federal government. And as you can see here, uh, we have a lot of states that are, that are essentially not funded sufficiently to handle another recession. And quite frankly, I probably don't have to tell anybody on the phone that it's only a matter of time until the next one, okay? Uh, so they're very cyclical, and it's going to happen again, probably in another three, four years, we'll see something happen again. And um, so what the states try to do is have a certain amount of money in their trust funds uh, that would be sufficient enough to handle the average of the last two recessions. So those would be the ones in green, where it says 1.0 plus, right? So you see only a few states 
are in a position today to handle any kind of a recession should it happen tomorrow. And those that are in maroon on this map, I mean, they don't even calculate at this point. Um, so I, I don't want to get too detailed with this calculation and what it all means, but um, essentially what we're trying to show you on this map is these states are not sufficiently funded to handle a recession should it occur. And that probably doesn't come as that big of a surprise to anybody attending today. Um, so we're not out of the water. Um, the recession did happened for the most part back in 08, 09, and 2010. Uh, since then, we've started to improve, but we're a long way away from being out of the water. The average cost of an unemployment claim today is still over $5,000. Folks are collecting unemployment benefits on average for almost 17 weeks whenever they file. Uh, we still have a national unemployment rate around 6.5%, so we got a lot of work to do. Employers and I guess I, I, I should say this right now, in case anyone didn't know already, this is a this is a tax. This is a uh, an unemployment tax cost that can be controlled by the employer. So what we're going to talk about and share with you today is how those taxes are calculated and what you can do to help minimize uh, your liabilities on that. I think I had one more slide here just to give you another. Idea. I don't mean to be all gloom and doom, but I mean basically this is the way it is. So the average tax cost for 2014 is around $490. So you see how that's kind of come down since 2012, uh, but we're still a long way from 2008, uh, you know, average rates, which was $313. So Josh, I think as I as I mentioned earlier, you know all of these errors and the and the trust fund balances, um, you know it's really it's really driven a focus on UI integrity. So maybe you could just enlighten everybody on on what that's all about. Sure, absolutely, Dave, and uh, thank you very much. And uh, really, as a result of everything that Dave had just mentioned, uh, the Department of Labor and state agencies have enacted certain laws that really help combat kind of a, a bleeding unemployment system out there, if you will. Uh, so this page really just kind of shows you what the unemployment, uh, what the UI integrity law actually states. Uh, but the UI legislation actually focuses on compliance requirements for employers uh, that are responding to unemployment claims. So all states now are in compliance with this new federal law, and each state has their own financial or other penalties that are associated with non-compliant employers. So really the days of ignoring claims that are coming in, uh, even if someone is eligible to collect unemployment, are, are no longer. Moving forward, it's, it's really a matter of compliance right now, responding to state requests, responding to every claim that comes in, having proper documentation, uh, or else it's going to result in either financial penalties or, or other penalties uh, um, that the states uh, have enacted. So to help combat or to help employers really kind of manage the un unemployment integrity laws that are out there, uh, they have developed what's called the State Information Data Exchange System, or SIDES is what it's called. Uh, basically, this is an electronic exchange that employers and third-party agencies like ourselves can communicate directly with the states electronically, pass back and forth information about uh, unemployment claims uh, electronically. Uh, this really kind of is supposed to cut down and reduce the amount of time it takes uh, and make sure that those, uh, those documentations are passed back and forth uh, timely and accurately. Uh, really the result of a better communication process, uh, we're looking to reduce benefit overpayments that the states are paying out, as well as assigning accountability for the employers and the states as well, and also kind of direct a, a more uniform requirements as far as uh, uh, when, when uh, folks do apply for unemployment and what's needed from employers to respond to those claims. And as you can see on this map here, most states are already live on sides, um, and by the end of 2015, I would say um, almost all states will be live on the sides exchange program. Yeah, and I guess uh, just to add to that a little bit, Josh, so in, in summary, you know, 
uh, that this focus on UI integrity and the, and the errors in the system, you know, one of the things that the states complained about essentially was that they don't get good information from employers when a claim is filed. Therefore, they're making poor determinations, allowing benefits to be paid out, only to reverse those decisions later on in an unemployment hearing and then crediting the employer's account for any of the benefits that are paid out. Um, so what's happened here is, as a result of the UI integrity legislation, they're requiring employers to provide sufficient information at the time that claim is initially filed, and they're requiring them to provide that information timely. Uh, and then I guess if they don't, then the, they're and they become a non-compliant employer, they're not, they're not going to get that relief of any of those benefit charges. Um, so that, that's really important. And I think what SIDES does is expedites the process of communicating when a claim is filed. Um, so instead of unemployment documents sitting on mail trucks for three and four days, and by the time I get that claim, I only have two days to reply to it, um, the electronic communications kind of give you at least two to three more extra days maybe to pull that information together. Would, would you agree with that, Josh? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really creates a more efficient process, not only for employers, but also for the states as well to help, uh, you know, kind of clean up the system on, yeah. on all aspects. So now really what we want to get into here is a little bit about uh, really kind of unemployment 101 how the system works, and then also provide, uh, you know, some best practices that, uh, that you could possibly uh, incorporate to, uh, to your own unemployment uh, management program. So uh, I'm going to start off with uh, Dave kind of to explain a little bit of how that unemployment uh, process works. Well, I think what we want to do here is just start out with a little bit of a high-level overview, you know, how unemployment is funded. Um, essentially, you know, with, with the folks that are on today's call, I think this is a very important because it ties back in specifically as to how they can market in their competitive environments. Um, but unemployment is funded for through employer payroll taxes. It's called an unemployment tax or a state unemployment insurance tax. Um, there is a federal tax that's also paid, which is pretty much a flat rate for every employee of, of, of right around $42 per employee. The federal unemployment tax that you pay basically pays for the administration of the unemployment systems at the state level. The state unemployment taxes that you pay funds the benefits that are paid out. Okay? So uh, in every state in which an employer has operations, they have kind of an unemployment state tax account. And you can kind of, that's on this slide, it's reflected uh, by that circle. Every quarter, the employer pays taxes into that account, while at the same time, the states are using monies to pay benefits out to former employees. Um, the amount of money that an employer pays in is based upon two things. One is what we call a taxable wage base. So that is simply the amount of wages an employee earns that you pay unemployment tax on. In our example here on this slide, it's Colorado. Um, Colorado employers pay unemployment tax on the first $11,700 every employee earns. So even if they earn $100,000 a year, they only pay unemployment tax on the first $11,700. How much they pay is now that percentage which you see to the right. That's actually your unemployment rate. And that's based upon your past experience. So it's an insurance program. It's pretty simple to understand. If the state takes more out of your account than you're putting into it on an annual basis, your unemployment tax rates go up. In Colorado, it can go up to as high as 10.87%. So if I multiply that by the 11.7, it's going to be $1,272 per employee. If you control and reduce the amount of monies, however, that come out of those state reserves, and, and make sure that only those people that should receive benefits are those getting paid. Make sure there's no administrative errors and things like that. You can actually minimize your liabilities and lower your unemployment rate. And in the state of Colorado, as you see here, it can go down to under 1%, all the way down to 8 tenths of a percent, basically, 
or just $95 per employee. So it's quite a range from 95 to 1200, right? Um, but uh, the the thing that remains constant in all states, and and really anytime you talk about taxes, we have to talk about tax brackets. So all states compute their rates in brackets. So maybe you're at a one percent rate, but you're at the upper end or lower end of that rate bracket, and it doesn't take a whole lot coming out of your account to cause that rate to move just one bracket or another. If it does, you're then going to apply that on the taxable wages of everybody working for you in that state. So in this particular case, um, you know, if I've got 100 people, everybody's making $11,700, I'm paying unemployment tax on quite a bit of wages there. So that's, that's the way you have to look at that impact of that movement. Um, I hope that made some sense. I just I, I basically want to emphasize that really it's controlling and reducing the amount of money coming out of those accounts, building up your reserves, improving your experience, and that's how you lower your unemployment tax rates. And in, in the in the staffing industry, that's that's pretty big because that allows you to more favorably compete in the market. We'll come back at the end and we should have some time for questions if there are any. Um, what I'd like to do now is just jump over to claims and, and give everybody a little bit of an understanding of what happens when somebody files an unemployment claim. Um, so you'll see here in the third quarter of 2014, which is what we're currently in, somebody files an unemployment claim. What the states do is they go back and they look at a period of time called the base period to determine how much this person's going to collect in benefits and who, what employers are going to be charged for those benefits. So the base period, essentially in all states, for all intents and purposes, is the first four of the last five completed calendar quarters. So we're in the third quarter, 2014. That's not complete. It just started July 1. We're going to skip the most recent quarter and go to the four prior to that. So anybody that this particular employee worked for from July 1 of 2013, essentially, actually from April 1 of 2013 through March 31st of 2014, those employers have what we call potential liability on this claim. So if this individual is eligible for benefits, any of these employers' accounts could potentially be charged. And typically they're charged um, on a proportional uh, system. So if, if I earn $10,000 in the base period and Employer C paid me $5,000, they are basically on the hook for 50% of my, my benefits. Um, if, if Employer B then paid me $2,500, they are on the hook for 25%. All of these employers can protest their claims. Uh, and should they be favorable and their accounts not be charged, those charges just go to the to the state fund, and essentially everybody pays for that. Um, so that's kind of you know how where they go to determine how much the person's going to get in benefits. They look at the wages they had. Every state goes through a certain calculation, calculates the the weekly benefit amount, and then that person has a year on that claim to collect their unemployment benefits. Typically, you'll hear it's 26 weeks of benefits. So they could essentially collect 26 weeks during a 52-week period of time. What you'll find in the staffing industry a lot, and I'm probably this is of no surprise to those folks on the phone, is that you have people that might be on assignment for two or three days during a week. Um, so they'll collect partial benefits. Um, and so, you know, essentially they're collecting just a portion of their unemployment every week. Um, they could be collecting every week. You know, so it's 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 kind of an interesting phenomena as you look at it, and uh, the one that's why it's just so important to pay attention to who's filing, when am I being charged, uh, and for who am I being charged? No. Josh, I think I'll, I'll I'll go back to you now. You know, we talked about what how it's funded and what the state does when an unemployment claim is filed. 
now really what is on what's the employer's role in this whole process sure thank you dave and that's um that's some great information and uh, uh it really blows me away every time how complex this system and the process really actually is but you know this slide is great because it really shows you the life cycle of a claim and i guess what the involvement is of an employer throughout that life cycle um, the one thing i do want to point out um, if you do have an efficient uh, process in place um, you can really avoid taking claims throughout this entire life cycle, spending your resources and time um, fighting unemployment claims and protesting claims. So you really want to kind of focus on uh, trying to have an efficient process to be able to win claims more at that protest level rather than, like I said before, spending your time and resources um, going through the claims process. Uh, but uh, you do need to have a process in place if a claim does go to a hearing, if you do need to appeal, and have a good understanding of what all that entails. Um, there's a couple of aspects uh, that uh, you should probably have in place today that would help you really kind of manage the process and help you win claims at that protest level. And on the next slide here, two of those key areas to really kind of focus on is to really have uh, some reporting capabilities. Um, you need to be transparent into the process and into into the system, really for a couple of key key reasons. First of all, to identify any problem areas so that you can identify those, you can get those corrected, and provide any training and education uh, that you need to your field folks uh, to be able to properly manage any claims coming in. Um, second of all, a good reporting capabilities would uh, so you can identify any liability out there. And what I mean by that is your field folks can be able to identify fo um, your employees that are collecting unemployment and be able to place them into jobs more quickly as to not, uh, I guess, essentially, Dave, drain the unemployment out of that reserve balance that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I mean, especially in the staffing industry, it's, it's just critical to, you know, I mean, the best way to control your unemployment costs is to keep your keep your mm -hmm. staff working, right? Absolutely. Um, and if if you don't have them, and if you have to fill assignments, you know, fill those who uh, if if you if you keep track of that, you know, you have the ability to determine who do I have the most remaining liability on, or who is my risk the highest on, and those are the people that I want to put back to work first. Sure. No, that's 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 a good point, and that's what good reporting and uh, good transparent into your process will allow you to do. Um, on top of that, training and education of your field managers to properly document separations, uh, to have those proper documentations in place, and also to keep up on the legislative changes that are out there as, uh, as the system continues to change. Um, any updates um, that you are made aware of ahead of time could greatly benefit uh, this process for you. Josh, if I could just go back a slide to uh, to the claim process, you know, this, this separation, um, you know, we can't say enough about it, and especially in the in the staffing industry, it's it's extremely important to track every separation that occurs. Okay, because what's going to happen is somebody goes on an assignment, they finish that assignment, they are now out of work due to a lack of work. Okay, so they are out of work as a result of an eligible separation. They are going to receive unemployment benefits. And that might happen a couple times. So they have a claim open. Remember I said that claim was good for a year? Mm -hmm. So what happens now is they go to work uh, for someone and, you know, for one reason or another, uh, you know, they do, they, there's some violation of a policy or they do something wrong and the employer decides to terminate that person. Keep in mind that the state is paying benefits on a lack of work separation in their mind, so it's extremely important for the employers to track, document every time that person separates from employment and report that to the state agencies when, when something like that happens, right? So subsequent separations can, or the lack of documenting them, can often result in continued benefits being paid out when they shouldn't be. Uh, the only other thing I might add to that, too, is, uh, you know, refusals of suitable work offers. You know, you have somebody who um, 
has performed assignments, have worked for certain amount of earnings, you know, per hour. Uh, they've traveled a certain distance before. I mean, all of a sudden they don't want to do that anymore. Um, you know, so potentially, you know, you can stop benefits based on a refusal of a suitable work offer when they've performed that work before. Um, you know, if it if it causes some sort of undue stress or something on the on the claimant, that's that. You know, so it doesn't always work. Um, so they can prove that they had good reason for refusing that offer. Uh, but but the separations, you know, I can't say enough about this is just critical in this industry because there are multiple separations that are occurring while one claim is in play. Okay, so. No, you're absolutely right, Dave. And the, the staffing industry is, uh, that's, I think, one of the reasons why it has to be, this process has to be managed almost differently almost than any other industry. Absolutely. So, no, great points. Thank you. So I do want to take you to the slide, and of course, uh, I'm a little biased, I guess, on uh, on how we manage this process, but uh, I think we do a great job of taking a holistic approach and wrapping our arms around the entire unemployment claims, or what we call unemployment cost management process, through claims management, appeals and hearings. Uh, the benefit charge audits that I know Dave had mentioned earlier is, is really key there, and it's really tough for employers to really manage that aspect of it simply because it, it's very detailed uh, to really take a look at those benefits going out and making sure they're accurate. So that's, that's one thing I know that a lot of our unemployment clients benefit from just by that service alone uh, is to check those benefits going out, and then we can go back and protest those on your behalf to the state. Um, Dave, I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to I think to the add. only thing I would add to that is, you know, it is difficult. I mean, we have, obviously, we have the tools in place to do it and the systems mm -hmm. in place. Uh, but from an employer perspective, I mean, just do the simple things, right? I mean, so if you get a charge statement from the state that says, here are the people that you're being charged on employment for, just make sure they're former employees of yours. Cause that's a common error that, that mm -hmm. employers are charged for people that never worked for them. Uh, make sure that it's it's not a claim that you are if you are pursuing uh, denial of benefits on that. Make sure you can test that benefit charge. Um, that essentially is it's kind of like reconciling a checkbook. You know, here are the withdrawals that are going on on your account. Make sure they're all accurate. And uh, absolutely, regardless of of what's going on, kind of from the claim standpoint. You always have to verify what the state is charging to your account. And then every year, unfortunately, you get a new unemployment rate. Those will start coming out probably here uh, in October or so um, for 2015. And uh, you, you reconcile everything and, and verify that your rate's accurate. No, that's, uh, that's a great point, Dave. Thank you very much. And. Uh, uh, and along the lines of verifying that your rate is accurate, um, the whole reason why you want to have an efficient process like this in place is really to make sure that, that tax rate is as low as possible. I think as Dave mentioned before, that's the only r tax that you can actually have an impact on and can lower it. So we actually have a team of folks that really, that's all they do, and that's really what uh, you should kind of be focused on as well, is to make sure that those rates are accurate. Look for any voluntary contributions or joint account opportunities. Even if you're experiencing a merger and acquisition, that can have an impact on your unemployment tax rate. And uh, also, as Dave mentioned earlier, that, uh, that that rate, even just going up one tax bracket, can have a huge impact on your bottom line. And I think we should, you know, just to explain... Um, not, not sometimes, and we apologize because we, this is all we talk about every day. <laughs> um, but a voluntary contribution is basically a, a buy down of your unemployment rate. So when your rates come out, um, about half of the states in the country allow you to, they'll allow you to write a check, send it in within 30 days, and in that check should be enough just to, just to cause your rate to go down one tax bracket. So as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it could be as little as $500, you know, if that changes your tax rate and you apply that incremental change to your total taxable payroll, the savings far outweigh what it costs to, to, to get it down. So 
Uh, voluntary contributions are some. If you're not looking at them today, definitely look at them. Joint and common rates, we talk about that. Um, that basically is in certain states, about 13 of them out there. If you have multiple legal entities within those states, you can combine the experience of any two or more um, to get a lower unemployment rate that, that's common amongst all of the entities. Um, so you'll usually have somebody that wins and loses in that process, but the organization overall is going to spend less than unemployment tax. Um, so, you know, and then there's some special rating strategies. Arkansas, you can, you can, you, there's some options associated with whether you want three or five years of experience uh, included in your rate. In New York, they allow you to write off negative, negative balances and things like that. All I'm saying is that there's a lot more to this than just responding to an unemployment claim and sending it back into the state. Uh, it becomes very important to see who the state's charging your account for, and then when those tax rates come out, make sure you take advantage of every opportunity you can to, uh, to, to lower the rate and save money. Now, great points again, Dave. Um, and I guess what, what we're kind of trying to say here is what it all comes down to is that if this process isn't managed properly, it can be extremely costly to, uh, to employers. Absolutely. I mean, just... I mean, one missed claim, one untimely appeal, you know, a missed voluntary contribution. You know, if, if the needle moves, just one bracket, and, and these brackets are typically very small. They could be a tenth of a percent. So I'm just saying moving one bracket, sometimes they'll move two, two or three brackets. Um, so any movement in that, in that tax rate, you have to apply that to your total taxable payroll and that often can either cost or save, right? If it goes down, it can save thousands of dollars. And in the staffing industry, I can now more effectively compete in my market. And that's what it's all about, being able to compete with the market, uh, having higher margins on your uh, uh, on your clients and the process or the uh, the products that you have out there. So. Um, I think that's all we have for today as far as slides go, so I'd love to open it up to the floor for any questions and answers. And Amanda, I don't know if you want to uh, uh, kind of run that or not. Sure. Sounds great. Thank you so much for sharing the information. Um, I, I know that there's a lot to talk about in this area, so I think you guys did a really great job of covering some really key aspects of ways that employers can kind of take the reins and take control of it and help reduce their overall costs. And I think it was a great point to talk about the voluntary contribution. Is, if you um, were to do that and go that route, does that have any effect on what your future ratings or percents would be on, on your um, next year? Does it have any impact on that or would it still remain the same? Um, so it would, it, yes. I mean, basically what you're doing is you're adding directly to your reserve balance. Um, now, typically we would hope it wouldn't have to be too much um, because the lower your voluntary contribution would, would require to be, the, the more your savings would be probably. Um, we usually typically don't want an employer to pay in any more than they need to, right? So... Um, if it only, in, in the example I used, it was $500. You could pay in 1000 if you wanted, but now you're paying 500 more than you need to, and it would go into your reserve balance, so that might impact your, your future tax rates. I don't know if that answered your question. Um, no, it did, yeah. And, and how would you know what amount to, that you would need to supply? Are, are they giving you that information? Yes, that, that's usually provided on the rate notice itself. Um, so, and basically what it is, is it's a, it's a ratio. So um, whenever we talk about unemployment insurance or insurance period, we're talking about risk. And the way they calculate your risk in the unemployment world is you have a, a reserve balance. It really is like a bank account. So you have a, a, a certain amount of money, for example, in the state fund. And what they do is they divide that by your average annual payroll. 
So when you change that ratio, that's what changes your rate. So what we do is we calculate that, and you can do this. The instructions are typically on the rate notices, um, but you can calculate it just enough to change that, that ratio so that it moves you into that next bracket. Okay. And when you make changes to um, any of the procedures that you're doing, um, so you're, you basically had indicated that the rates for the 2015 calendar year are going to be out in October of this year. So any changes that you've made then wouldn't really affect it, you until the following year as far as future rates? That's a great question. Um, you know, so the typically the, the, the unemployment rates are in effect from January through December. The, the, the components that calculate what those rates are usually are from July through June. So, you know, essentially all of your 2015 rates at this point, there are a couple exceptions, not many, um, are basically determined at this point. So anything you're doing today would impact strongly your 2016 rates as it relates to claims and, and charge checking and things like that. Right. So that, that's a great point. You know, the sooner that you make those changes, um, then you'll be able to start seeing an impact on the future rates. Right. Okay. Um, I have another question that came in. I received a notice for unemployment hearings um, every few weeks or so, and there is a scheduled time that they're supposed to call me but I have never received a call for this. Do I get penalized for not attending these calls? Um, boy, that you know, the, the penalty associated with that might be that the hearing took place without you, and you might have lost, right? So uh, I, you know, without any, without seeing the notice, I don't know. But sometimes they'll require you to call them with a phone number that they're supposed to reach you at. Um, ahead of time, or there's there's a specific phone number that you need to call. But you know, it it, it sounds like I don't know why they wouldn't call you. Um, you know, and you really do need to provide that that specific phone number to most states. And if they're calling into a general switchboard, you want to make your switchboards aware that hey, I've got a hearing. You might get a call from the state of. Minnesota or whoever it might be. Um, so I, I know I can't really answer that question with too much, uh, too many specifics because I'd have to see the notice. But um, that's what it might sound like that maybe there's a phone number that needs to be provided that, that possibly wasn't. I don't know. Are you able to call into these, or do you have to wait for them to call you? Well, that depends on the state, Amanda, and uh, okay. some some states you call in, other states they call you. It just it it kind of differs from state to state. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and now you had given an example of Colorado where you had shown what the tax liability was and what the minimum and maximum per person or per employee charges. That was a, a great. Um, piece of information, and now I know we have a lot of clients that service multiple states or are in states throughout the United States, and I just wanted to make mention of a tool that we have on our website um, at tricom.com slash resources. It's under the tax tools, and there is a, a downloadable document for every single state that will tell you the exact information um, that was mentioned about Colorado. It's good for everyone to, to know that, particularly if you're um, working in multiple different states. Uh, in, and you guys may also have another type of resource like that available for someone, um, but I did want to mention that tool today. Sure. That, I mean, it's, it's, it's great information to have and, and resources like that where you can get to them. Um, we, do, we, we actually post out on, our, uh, on the Equifax Workforce Solutions blog uh, what we call flash reports. So we update that kind of information periodically and provide those tools as well. Okay, so great. Some great resources um, for people to be able to access that information. Um, another question that has come in is, can, can using a PEO or employer of record help or hurt your UI rate? So um, 
it's an interesting relationship um, in that typically the employees, so if I am a, a client of a PEO, Professional Employee Leasing Company, um, then I am for all intents and purposes leasing their employees from the PEO. Um, so that the PEO assumes the liability on those people. They're paying the tax on those people. Now they're probably charging that back to me uh, in some way. Um, you know, it depends on our relationship and the contract and how that all works. Um, but you know, I would say in some cases, in most cases, it's probably going to help the employer's UI rate. And what may also happen sometimes with PEOs is they may distribute the cost amongst the different sure. staffing companies they're working with. So it might just also depend on what they have in their portfolio and what their rates are to see if that's something that may hurt or help you. Absolutely. I mean, it's a great question. I mean, if it, you know, again, it's, it's, it's just sometimes it, it's in the details. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, usually that's the case. I mean, the, the volumes usually help. Okay. Um, can you tell me, I know at one point the states were, um, because they did not have enough funds in their reserve, the federal government was um, basically supplementing that, and the states had to pay those funds back to the government. Uh, was my understanding. Are there still states that still need to repay this or if there's any increase in rates to employers because of the situation? Yes, there's there's currently uh, 14 states are still in uh, in, a, in a repayment status on the, what's, what's called uh, Title 12 loans from the Federal Unemployment Reserves. Um, and, and yes, all those states have to pay that money back. Uh, you know, the interest was, was waived, uh, which was nice. But, um, and typically, uh, the states have to make some payment or, or the equivalent of a portion of that payment by a certain time of each year. If they don't make that, um, then what's going to happen is they will get an increase in that federal unemployment tax I mentioned. Um, so the, the federal unemployment tax, let's talk about that uh, briefly, is for all intents and purposes, it's six-tenths of a percent on the first $7,000 every employee earns. So it's $42 per employee. Now in some states that don't make that payment back on their Title 12 loans or, or a portion of that payment by a certain time, they, they get a, uh, an additional tax on that federal tax. It's usually a three-tenths of a percent increment. So if you're in one of those states, it might have gone from 0.6 to now 0.9. So now you're paying $63 per employee. Um, there are a couple of states that are up at like 1.2, okay? Um, so they're still in repay mode. Um, now, some states are getting pretty creative in how to pay those loans back, whether it's, you know, Michigan, they, they generated a bunch of bonds to pay it back. I think Texas did something similar to that. Um, so there's some creative ways of doing it, and they've, they've been effective. Um, but yeah, where you're going to see the increase in taxes, Amanda, is on the federal unemployment tax. Okay, great. I have a couple more questions that have come in. Oftentimes, employees will fail to maintain con contact after an assignment, then file for unemployment. Are these claims protestable? And if so, what is the best practice to help ensure we win the claim? Sure, so uh, failure to maintain contact is, is pretty common in your industry. Um, so it's important to have some best practices in place when you do that because, um, you know, when those folks go out and they file for unemployment, um, they're not exactly uh, eligible to receive unemployment because if they've been offered a job or a similar type offer that they have in the past and have just not either accepted or have, 
um, not come back after a job and said that they're ready for or they're eligible for a continued job, um, th those claims are protestable and you should have the proper documentation to be able to protest that at the, at the first stage of the claim life cycle. Yeah, I, I think what I would add to that is, you know, I mean, the, the initial claim, when somebody files a claim, in order for them to be eligible, they have to be out, they have to be able and available for work, they have to be actively seeking work. So, you know, when someone finishes an assignment, even though they're out of work because of a lack of work, if if they don't contact the branch and see if there's another assignment for them to take on, um, then some would argue that they're not actively seeking work, uh, and in some cases, maybe they're not even available for work, right? So they're restricting their availability. Um, so it's important to know that, yes, you can protest those claims. It's also important that the employer must have a policy, uh, and most staffing employers know this and have this these days, but that they have a policy that, that, that the employee knows when you finish an assignment you must contact the branch um, to, to see if there's another assignment to go on. Now, some states don't necessarily uh, automatically deny benefits uh, based on that, but, um, you know, availability is always in question. So if the person didn't, again, if they didn't have good reason for not contacting the employer uh, and they weren't making themselves available, you should be able to deny benefits. And the important key there is to make sure you properly document Absolutely. any communication with the employee so you can present that at the uh, protest level. Yeah, and that goes to who they need to talk to mm -hmm. and everything else, right? Because they'll say, well, I left a voicemail, you know. I mean, <laughs> so you, you, unfortunately, you do have to be pretty detailed in that, in that policy. Okay. Now, what if an employee refuses a job offer similar to other offers they have accepted in the past and then um, proceeds to file for unemployment? Can you protest those claims? And, and if so, what process needs to be in place to ensure that you win that type of a claim? Sure. Uh, no, great question. And uh, very similar to the uh, separation policy as well. Um, a referral, and I think David mentioned this during the presentation as well a little bit, that uh, um, if someone is offered a position that's very similar to what they have currently accepted already, and for instance, if they just don't want to drive that distance anymore, don't want to work for that particular client, whatever the case might be, um, it's got to be properly documented, of course, that uh, um, that person has been offered a position, a similar position that they have accepted in the past, and proof of their denial. Um, and with that, should be able to be protested at that original protest uh, stage. But as Dave mentioned before, it really kind of depends on the state if that's really going to be a concrete enough. But yeah, it depends on the state, uh, you know, but the one thing to remember, too, is you might not get a claim, okay? So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the claim is out there. The person's receiving benefits. So if you get a refusal of work, you know, make sure you notify your state workforce agency, um, you know, that that I made this offer, it was refused, if benefits are being paid out, I would like to question the eligibility on that. Include what the offer was, what the rate of pay was, what the hours, you know, offered were. Um, you know, and in some cases, even though the person may have, let's say the person commuted 20, 20 miles before and they won't now, they might have moved. So it, it depends on whether or not their situation has changed, so on and so forth. But always, I always encourage reporting job refusals, and you should do it immediately, right? So do not wait two weeks to do that. Okay, Good point, great. Dave. Now, I just went ahead and opened up a poll, so if you could please um, take a moment as I um, read off the last question that we have come in. Um, give us some feedback. I will also put up the contact information um, that you can reach either Josh or myself with any further questions or for more information. Um, if you have any other questions, please do feel free to submit them in. Um, the last one I have at the moment is if an employee is let go for misconduct at a client's location, how do we submit evidence for a hearing without involving the client? 
Yeah, that's, that that one that one's probably fairly common. Um, you know, the best thing is is just documentation, documentation. I mean, so interview the client. You know, I mean, so if somebody was, I, I don't know, if they were, if if they if a client calls up and they had somebody who was uh, just violating, you know, something was mis misconduct, and they said, don't send this person to us anymore. We don't want to use them. But it was something serious enough that even myself as a staffing company just wants to terminate this person. I should probably document who it is at the client that I you know that I talked to. Obviously you really can't get them, nor would I encourage you to get them to participate in an unemployment hearing or anything along that line. But maybe they could shoot you an email, maybe they can shoot you a letter on their letterhead, um, so on and so forth as some documentation or evidence that this occurred. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of the information that um, I'm hearing is documentation, documentation. Um, that's a real key to um, fighting some of these claims. So with that, I don't have any other questions, so we'll wrap things up. I want to thank you guys again both for participating and sharing your knowledge of unemployment cost management. Uh, we will have a recording of the webinar available on our website at tricom.com under the Resources tab. You'll find it in the Industry Insider Webinar section. If you, again, have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to either Josh or myself. Um, and watch for more information on our next webinar session, which will be held on Thursday, August 21st, as our guest speaker, Wilson Cole from Adams, Evans & Ross, will present the seven deadly mistakes staffing and recruiting firms make in collecting debt. I hope you all have a fantastic afternoon, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda.